So in general, you know, whether you're using a straightforward manipulation or a stage manipulation, you want a strong manipulation. In, uh, we'll talk about some examples to the contrary, but in most cases, the stronger the manipulation, the better. So the reason for this is because, for one thing, it allows for a bigger effect. As we've talked about with statistics, the bigger the difference between the groups, the, the more likely you are to find that difference to be statistically significant, even with smaller uh, numbers of individuals. Conversely, if you're looking at a very small manipulation, and thus a very small effect, you might in turn need hundreds or even thousands of participants to find that statistically significant. So to have a bigger manipulation could save you time and money in getting more participants if you're looking at a real effect. It also offers a greater chance of others to replicate your results. Again, strong manipulations yield a bigger effect, it's more reliable, so if someone tries to replicate that effect, they're likely to have an easier time doing it for all the same reasons. Now, weak manipulations oftentimes aren't realistic because when we're reacting to everyday situations, we're usually reacting, at least uh, when in situations that we're interested in reactions to, we're usually reacting to pretty strong and interesting ones. Uh, so there's a great example on the TV show, I think it's an ABC TV show, uh, What Would You Do? And in one of these experiments, they had people um, ask what would they do if they, they saw a baby abandoned in a hot car, basically stuck in a hot car. And of course, everybody says they would call 911, they would look for the parent, they would do something about it. And when they actually ran this study, of course using a fake baby, but one that was very realistic looking and made realistic uh, motions and sound effects, a vast majority of people would stop, look at the baby, and then keep on walking by even though it was a hot day outside. So, you know, in the real world, we, we really want those strong naturalistic uh, uh, manipulations to sort of mirror what would happen in the real world. So I said that a little backwards. Basically, you want strong manipulations to mirror real world manipulations. Uh, there are some instances, though, in which stronger isn't better when actually a weaker manipulation might be preferable. They're rare, but they can come up. So for one thing, if you can show, in essence, a strong effect from a weak manipulation, that might actually be a really good test of the theory. So if you can get a very big behavior change with a very small difference between groups, in essence, you're showing how, uh, how important or big of an effect uh, that small difference can make. And that could have very good theoretical importance. A great example of this is with stereotype threat. Uh, with stereotype threat, it's the theory that if people feel like they may be negatively stereotyped, it's actually going to inhibit or worsen their performance in that area because they're so uh, preoccupied with performing well in that area to uh, sort of um, uh, contradict stereotypes that that creates anxiety and thus worsens behavior. So uh, one test of this, one of the very early tests of this, is with men and women um, with the stereotype that women are worse at math than men are. So in one condition, they offered men and women a math GRE test and simply said, this is a measure of math skills. Uh, what they did beforehand to make sure everyone was equally matched is they make sure to only pick men and women with the same types of grades in, in this was in the case, uh, college level math classes, and had previously shown uh, similar uh, math score testings or math testing scores. So what they found, though, is if they simply phrased it, this is a measure of math skills, uh, what they theorized was uh, the reason for this big difference, why men were outperforming women in this case, was because women would think to themselves, well, the stereotype is that women are worse at, at uh, math than men are. Uh, I don't want to prove that stereotype true, so I'm going to try really hard on this test. And according to stereotype theory, that has a contradictory effect where if you try so hard, you're going to get anxious and actually do worse on the performance. In other words, women are get so anxious during the test that they start to uh, outthink themselves, they start to second guess themselves, they don't uh, perform as efficiently thinking wise because they're spending so much thinking power worrying about the stereotype and then they end up doing worse on the test. A very weak manipulation of this is they had the exact same types of participants, the exact same test and simply said instead of this is a measure of math skills, they said this is a measure of math skills that has been shown to be unbiased against women, basically saying don't worry about the stereotype, this one's shown not to prove it right, and in this case, men and women performed exactly equally. No, no significant difference there at all. So this is one of those cool instances where they showed that a very, very weak manipulation, just basically an extra few words, could cause a huge outcome, showing really the importance of stereotype threat in its effect on behavior and performance outcomes. 
Also, sometimes we talked about how strong manipulations are more naturalistic. There are some times when actually a really strong manipulation is less naturalistic. You just have to sort of think about it logically. Uh, does your manipulation match something that would happen in the real world? So here's one that popped up a couple of years ago. I, I put in here just because I think it's ridiculous that this got studied. It's, it's kind of a ridiculous and, and funny example of a, a, a way too strong a manipulation. Um, they were interested in whether or not uh, what they call increased salience of pathogens are basically just making thinking, making people think about illness and sickness might increase intentions to use condoms. So you think a good manipulation like uh, uh, about this would just have them maybe read a news article about STI transmission, how easy it is to get STIs, or maybe another type of pathogen if they just wanted to generally increase uh, people's awareness about pathogen transmission and then measure how likely they would to be used condoms. Uh, but they went about in a different way. To uh, increase their salience about pathogens, they decided to basically expose half the participants to fart spray. It's a bit of a weird manipulation, but they reasoned that if you come into contact with a very uh, unpleasant human smell, that it's going to uh, in some way make salient the fact that humans can be diseased, that diseases can transfer, you could become diseased, and then they measured whether that would in fact uh, uh, intentions to use condoms. So they went into a, a room without, with or without the smell and then took a survey on whether or not they intended to use condoms. And this was, by the way, published in a very major journal. Um, so not too surprisingly, uh, this being their hypothesis, they found it to be true. The, the participants who were in the bad smell condition did report significantly being more willing to wear condoms in the future. Uh, so I guess, you know, it's hard to say how this correlates with real naturalistic manipulations, something that would happen to people in the real world. But I guess you could say that if you're on a date with someone and you want them to use a condom, well, you know what to do on that date to make that happen. Of course, it might completely ruin the date, but if they don't mind that so much, at least they'll use a condom. <laughs> so a bit of a weird and overly strong manipulation. So the last way in which stronger manipulations might not be the best is sometimes they can be unethical, like this example here. Sometimes you can get, go too far in, for example, exposing participants to real-world dangers to see how they'll react. Of course, this is why we have ethics boards in place now to make sure that this particular thing doesn't happen. But an example of that that came along uh, likely before they had an ethics board at the department is some uh, researchers wanted to recreate the Milgram study where they were asking basically people to shock uh, in the Milgram study, human participants to the point of death. In this study, they wanted to see, well, uh, would they shock puppies to the point of death? Uh, one of the reasons why they did this, actually the main reason, is because they thought, well, people in the Milgram study probably knew that the researchers wouldn't actually kill someone, and so they reasoned that participants would be more likely to, to go up to 450 volts because they didn't understand the real dangers of doing that. Uh, so they said, basically, we're going to recreate this with puppies where People are going to be asked to electrocute puppies to death, but actually use real electricity and actually indeed have people electrocute puppies to death. Because, of course, you can't have puppies act like they're dying. So in this study, many, many participants actually ended up killing their puppy, uh, which is, of course, you could talk about the ethics toward the animal, but just toward humans, that's really psychologically harmful. Because they walked away from that study knowing that they basically killed this little animal that was, you know, adorable and hadn't done any harm to them. So uh, in this case, you know, this study would be deemed totally unethical nowadays. It was way too strong of a manipulation and very likely had some long-term negative repercussions on these poor participants. And of course, the poor puppies along with it. 